Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. Hi, thank you so much for listening. I've been meaning to update my intro as I've finally been adding my husband's last name, but it has been just a whirlwind over here. I'm now back to in-person teaching on a cart at two schools, just barely managing drop-off and pick-up for my daughter around my schedule. Whew, anyone else feeling a bit of overwhelm at being back to school? For me, it's been a year and a half since I was in the classroom, so I was actually a bit nervous going back, but it's like riding a bike. All the old habits come back, some of which I'm trying to break, like shifting some of my language. It's also beautiful seeing students I last saw as second graders now in fourth grade. They've grown so much. It's incredible to reconnect with them after teaching via video for so long. Have you experienced any of that reconnection? If so, I'd love to hear about it. You can email me, Rebecca at teachingartistpodcast.com, DM me on Instagram at teachingartistpodcast, or even leave a voice message through the link in the show notes. And if I'm slow to respond, it's just that I'm trying to keep up with it all. This month's Art Educators Lounge, which we're actually also renaming Teaching Artists Lounge, is dedicated to coming together in community during this back-to-school time. Join me with Victoria Fry of Visionary Art Collective on Saturday, September 25th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern for this free meeting. You can register for free at the link in the show notes or at arteducatorslounge.eventbrite.com. And I would love to see you there. I love how Lauren Scott Corwin's work talks about the history of the land through the history of her paintings. Her process of layering, covering up what's underneath while leaving hints of the past is so meaningful. She talked about making quilts as well as paintings and where the two inform each other. Lauren also spoke about meeting students where they are and truly getting to know students as humans while also sharing yourself as a human. Lauren Scott Corwin is a semi-abstract artist who works with oil paint, printmaking, fiber, and installation. Her bold palette is meant to immerse the viewer with familiar patterns and narratives of common scenes with a nod to the uncanny. Her recent work has begun to explore elements of home, both as an idea and the structure itself, as this was redefined during the COVID pandemic. She continues to dissect our idea of home from a critical and playful standpoint, seeking to uncover guides and maps of the human experience that we know in 2020. Lauren Scott Corwin has maintained a life as both an artist and educator since the beginning of her career. Since her BFA in painting from Maryland Institute College of Art, followed by an MFA in painting from the University of Delaware. In 2019, she was awarded the David P. Hartman 52 Excellence in Teaching Award, alongside a full-year sabbatical and array of national exhibitions. She currently lives in the hills of western Massachusetts, teaching art at an independent school along with her young family. Let's hear from Lauren. All right, so I am speaking with Lauren Scott Corwin, and I'm excited to hear more about your background. And that's kind of where I like to start, is just how you got to where you are in terms of teaching and also art making. Well, thanks so much for having me today. Yeah. It's funny, I was just thinking about this too. I just started my 11th year teaching here. Wow. But yes, I know, this is nuts. And so thinking about how long I've been an educator, I I currently teach at an independent school for high school, so ninth through 12th, Mm -hmm. more or less. And I, I teach in the design, like kind of 
curriculum. So I, I do all the intro classes and also the AP class. So I get the kids mm-hmm. that are really like psyched about art school. I know I'm probably jumping ahead. So thinking a little bit about how I got here. Yeah. So basically as, as a kid, one of the biggest things that changed my life was going to summer camp. And that was one of the things that when I was in fourth grade, I remember my parents just signed me up and like, didn't really tell me what they were doing. Like they, they must've had like a vacation planned or something. And like, <laughs> yeah, like you're yeah. going away. <laughs> right. Grandma wasn't around or something. So I, I went to sleepaway camp for a week. It was like the most me I've ever felt, you know, I, I went to a small school. And so for, for me to know like the same 30 kids between kindergarten through 12th grade, I was kind of just like, yeah, like I met a new set of people. And I felt like I was part of this, this really bigger community. We were out in the woods all summer. So that was super fun. And what ended up happening was I ended up going there every year until I could work there. And so then I became a camp counselor. And for me, like, I never thought about teaching until I became a camp counselor. I was probably a 10th grader or 11th grader when I started to work there. I had to do like a a summer of training. So I guess it was 11th grade, my first summer. And one of the things that I ended up doing there was just like bonding with kids, like seeing myself in these children. And Mm -hmm. most of the time I worked with like the middle school aged kids. So like that was like, you know, the ripe time where no one, you know, everyone's sort of figuring out like their identity and totally (laughs) you know like everyone I know that works in the middle school realm is always like us like just an awkward group of it's like an awkward time (laughs) essentially like it doesn't matter who you are what you're about it's just like that's the time where everyone's kind of (laughs) awkward and I I don't know like for some reason that was like pretty cool for me to just hang out with them and see what they were about and listen and it just really changed the game for me I know that I had a really inspiring teacher at my high school my art teacher was really inspiring and I'm not saying I didn't have like great adults in my life, but like when you hit like a, a point in your life where you're like, my parents aren't hearing what I'm doing. And then you finally find that one mentor that sort of, you know, tells you in, in not so many words that you're worth listening to. I, that's a pretty profound thing. And so for me, that was definitely once I, I was able to connect with a bunch of children. And I, I remember I, I got my first letter from them, like one specific kid who was really homesick and was really embarrassed about it because you know when you're in seventh Mm -hmm. grade and you're homesick you don't want to admit that and it was one of those things where I just ended up chatting with him and we went on a couple walks and finally I got a note from him at the end of the week that was kind of like thank you so much for listening to me that was what Mm -hmm. I needed and I made it through the week and I'm very proud of myself and felt like this was kind of a calling yeah but I didn't actually start to teach weirdly enough like I didn't have like a plan I feel like I kind of went (laughs) <laughs> when you're like a product of the 90s and the resources really weren't developed yet for me it was like I went to art school and I'm sure things are different now for those people but like if you're going into early education like there was just not a program I I felt like I could take to do that yeah to do like both art and yeah education exactly yeah I felt like there was like two paths and for me like I I never like Maybe I just was naive and didn't ask the right questions, which is totally probable. Like it took me a little bit of time to figure out how to do that because I was very quiet in high school. So I I definitely just kind of went through and just did things I really wanted to try. Like I took a lot of like classes I never thought about, you know, graduated with a painting degree, but I knew my path with with art was always going to be there. I just wanted to see what else I could do with it. And Mm -hmm. that was when I decided to go to graduate school. And honestly, when I got there, part of my, so I went to to school at University of Delaware, which was, you know, a a big university. The grad program was kind of smaller, but I got synced up with like an intro color theory class. And Mm. that was when I was like, oh yeah, this is the level I love. Like those students were just really on point. They were just older. I felt like I could kind of deep dive into different things that were a little less cosmetic. Like we actually could do some, some really interesting things you can go places you know like I don't know there's some there's something about the freedom of, of having college level students that I thought was just like really compelling and like mm. why I did what I what I wanted to do like this was like my career choice like for sure so mm. yeah so that was the end of that I mean literally after that like really hadn't looked back my my path was just I did the hustle for a long time after grad school. I graduated in 2008. And for anyone that remembers that time, it was not an easy time to get a job. No. (laughs) Yeah. So what I ended up doing was 
I'm not sure where I even learned this from, but I decided it would be, so I grew up in New Jersey, I should have mentioned that. And I literally hit up every county college in the state, just uh, like, didn't even have to ask me, like, like to have to put a post out there. I just kind of sent them a letter being like, hey, I've looked at your curriculum and these are the classes I'm willing to teach. And, and I'm qualified to teach. And I actually ended up getting hired by a county college in Morris, which is like an hour and some change away. And I lived with my parents. So I ended up commuting for two years. So I taught wow. semesters with them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then for my like health insurance, I like I worked at Starbucks. <laughs> So right. I had a couple of things it together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the dance was real. Uh, like, um, but it was definitely like really rewarding. And I'm super glad I kept with the teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was a tough time. I mean, for employment in general, I, I know a lot of people that were just struggling with, you know, when you're like that age, and you're just like trying to get your footing into the world. I mean, I was commiserating with a, a lot of humans, like everyone I, I worked with Starbucks with were like professionals who were just mm. like, this is the time where we have to, this is what we have to be doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I graduated, I got my MFA in 2009. So similar. Yes, <laughs> like, totally. What now? Right. Oh. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's like not the right years to finish with an art degree. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting now too, because not to get off topic, but like you hear students now, particularly the kids that are like really thinking about art school and they're like, oh man, will I make money? And it's mm-hmm. funny enough, I never asked that question no. as a student or, you know, it's just like something like, well, it's like, I love to do this. Why wouldn't I do this? Like it, it just never right. occurred to me to not be an artist <laughs> or a teacher. So it's it's interesting now that I feel like kids have a lot more self awareness and like what's a, what they're able to do and mm-hmm. part of that probably has to do with the fact that they're all digital natives and they've just had access to information their whole life but for me it's just like it's been just such a labor of love that <laughs> sometimes I, I like yeah. I'm like oh poor naive Lauren had to deal with some things yeah. <laughs> uh, I so relate to that too just like not really thinking through. <laughs> what am I going to do with this? Just like, this is what I like. I'm going to study this. And <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's, that's literally my entire like twenties. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I just nailed it. Yeah. So then you taught at the college level for a while. And at what point did you shift over to high school? Yeah. So my situation was, I basically knew that it, this wasn't going to be a long-term solution. And I had a notebook that was like just a normal school book. And uh, every time I applied to a job, I would write, you know, where I applied, all of the stuff that I gave to them and the date. And I think by the time, and I, I knew that I was like, all right, we're sticking with college. I had no qualms with anywhere in the country. I did not have any filters. I just knew that I just needed, this is sort of what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. And I also didn't have a family or partner I just like you know I was at that stage where I was just like this is it this is I'm just gonna make a choice for my job and I remember having this binder which I really or the notebook that I recently found which had like 250 applications in it Ugh. in the two years that I was working I just it's wild it's nuts and I've, I've definitely had some cool interviews come from those like I wasn't hitting like I wasn't getting rejected all of the time which was nice <laughs> which <laughs> I was a little bit hopeful, but you know, I, I flew different places and like, you know, I interviewed in Texas and California. Anyway, somebody somewhere told me like, try independent schools, you know, like they're, they don't really have the same, you know, they, they hire on merit like colleges do based on, you know, not based on like your, any background that you have with like, like any sort of teaching credentials. And I was like, Okay. Mm-hmm. Which I know sounds kind of terrible when I say it out loud, but <laughs> kind of an interesting thing too, because like teaching has always been start, part of this. And I am sure we've hired people who don't normally teach at these schools, but for me, it was just like a no brainer. And so I did, I actually sort of, New England has a ton and I, you know, coming yeah. from New Jersey, I didn't know a whole lot about New England, but I, I knew it wasn't far. And I it just sort of was like, yeah, we'll see what happens. And that was when I started to actually get some momentum because I think that there, now that I've been on the other side, I see like the hiring practices. It's like, yeah, you want to have people who kind of have a sense of what they're doing. My school, I've been really lucky because they've actually really wanted to hire somebody who was a practicing artist and not just somebody who was like kind of fluent in it, but did some other stuff. So for me, you know, having a gallery show once in a while was like totally something the school was expecting and like wanted and promoted Mm -hmm. and 
was really good about sort of showing our skills as teachers as well as artists. So I thought that was a pretty cool fit. That's amazing. And they, I know you've talked about in other places, the space that you have, that your studio until COVID was basically at the school. Was that sort of something that's another way that they supported you as an artist or that was, you turned your like office into your studio. Is that right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So it's funny because I mean, the school has a huge history of just like spaces. I know they've evolved without getting into the details of it. Essentially, when they got to the point where I was, I was hired in 2010. So this is like my 11th mm-hmm. year. They had a new art building. Like that was the the thing they decided to invest in a couple of years before, because when, you know, they were trying to figure out kind of like what they were trying to make, like prioritizing the student body. And like, they had all the like, athletic stuff and they had, <laughs> they had the academics. And it's like the art building was that needed the upgrade. And so when I, mm. when I first showed up, I was one of the first teachers to like use it, <laughs> which was great. Nice. Like, my department, yeah. we, we got to move in. And although I wasn't part of the planning of this building, uh, studios were definitely something that all the art teachers, when when they were planning the building, were like, this is something that we should be getting. (laughs) And so they, so I I definitely, when I toured the building, I was just like in awe. I mean, this was during my interview. I remember being like, well, this is really cool. It's a really beautiful building. It's totally new Mm. and it has studios and they're not like huge. I mean, you know, no, it's like, 12 by 12. It's like a little guy, but it's mm-hmm. just a, it's a good space to like have your, your own yeah flavor in. Like you can really kind of do anything in it. And it's off the, the hallway that all my classrooms are in. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I really like about it is like when I have a time to just work, even like if it's an hour between stuff, two meetings or something, I'm in here and the door's open. Students pop in all the time. And sometimes I'll close my door for sure. But like, I always love having the dialogue with them where they're seeing me in my element and they're asking me questions mm. about it. So it's, I I think the studio has been a really, if anything, it's like served the school as well as served the artists that use it. So Right. Yeah, that's so powerful for the kids to see their teacher is also like a maker, like you're not, you're teaching what you do. Yeah. And it's definitely like, you know, I think one of the, not to get too tied up in this, but like one of the things that I always try to emphasize, particularly because I think in many schools, art tends to be like a required class to graduate. It's not like, you know, it's sort of considered an elective, you know, the kids that sometimes take it are like, okay, let's just get this thing going so I can get Mm -hmm. my diploma, you know, and I, I'm sure every subject has that, but with art, I think we kind of have the double-edged sort of always thinking about like, is this like a serious subject? You know, do kids, how do kids mm-hmm. view this? You know, is this playtime for them? You know, and just because it's fun doesn't make it less academic. So I definitely love like seeing you showing the students like, yo, I'm making a lifestyle out of this. This is like a huge thing that I didn't have when I was in high school. I I knew people did that. I didn't know. Like I said, I was like naive. But part of it was just sort of figuring out, like, how do I incorporate this in my life? Because this brings me joy. And I think when the kids particularly get so much joy out of it, it's like showing them what's possible. is like pretty cool. Yeah, that's so powerful to have those role models. Like you're you know, you become a role model for them, which I say that and that's a little scary to me still. Like, (laughs) you got to be on 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 my game on point, (laughs) really considering like how we're building those relationships with students. And definitely. And I guess that's another thing I like to talk about is just how you're doing that, how you're sort of building relationships and like creating your classroom environment. And then especially also thinking about anti-racism in the classroom and the power that we have as teachers, if you'd want to talk about that at all. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I think about a lot is like meeting students where they are. Mm -hmm. That for me is like always been one of my biggest teaching philosophies. You know, Mm -hmm. students will come to me and I know that this school has a very specific like niche in the world. Like we have a specific demographic and, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the time kids will show up and they have, I mean, this could be anywhere really, but like, you know, like there's the kids that have a, a lot of resources and the kids that don't have too many And I think that this particularly, and I'm going to come back to the classroom part, but like part of the year that I had to struggle with was the fact that we were doing synchronous learning. And so when you Mm -hmm. deal with students, when some of your students are at home and they're literally drawing on Xerox paper versus like a kid who's pretty much got anything that they need on the same Zoom call, like how do you sort of 
come to terms with that? You know, how do you like grade? I mean, even like the it's like there's like an element of shame to it for some kids. Mm-hmm. For me, it's like, how does my rubric get flexible in order to have everyone feel like they have a chance, <laughs> you know, and everyone's right. like they are seen in it? Yeah. So that was something I've definitely had. It was like kind of a dance that I didn't think I was going to have to do this year. I mean, I think COVID just sort of threw all the educators out in a different realm, right? <laughs> no matter where you work. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But for me, I, I think about my, so I teach 2D design, for example, and the, the students that take this class, it's an intro level class, but it's everyone from ninth grade all the way up to seniors. And mm. they show up all at different stages of the development. They, they show up with different backgrounds from different parts of the country, from even from international students. And prompts that I try to give with 2D design, which I, I think is really one of my favorite topics is is 2D just because it does have so much you can borrow from drawing but at the same time there's so much invention and innovation that you can really kind of find mm-hmm. you know so a lot of times i will find like my favorite my first thing i ever do in class for their homework is to find a designer that you like and they'll come to class with a little blurb about someone and this is not just i mean you could find your your traditional ones that everyone picks but i'm talking like Find something that's designed in this world that you interact with that you love and find Mm -hmm. who's behind that and see what you can come to the class and explain. You know, and we've had students, I've come to class like explaining how people design golf courses or even the things that you don't think about in the fine arts. Yeah, there's people that are creatively like thinking about how we interact with space, with nature, with buildings, with cars. It's all Mm -hmm. the things that we own fashion, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah. And my hope is that they start to see that artists generally run the world. We pretty much like, (laughs) like it's so embarrassing when they start to see like, oh, snap, like a person did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Person did that. And they have a creative background and that's a pretty cool skill. So yeah, that's amazing. Just the idea of digging into something that they already kind of interact with and like and having to find out who made this, you know, whatever this thing is that I'm, you know, whether it's the space I'm in, like, that's a great thing to think about. Or maybe it's like, who made this cup I'm holding or whatever. (laughs) That's a great practice. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's, it's really cool, too, because like, there's no drawing for the first project, they show up with a writing assignment. And then, you know, it's like their skills don't have to be flexed quite yet. I mean, you know, there's always some kids that are like a little bashful about it, but also just we do a little show and tell and they get to explain a little bit. And I just think that there's something about it that everyone learning from each other is is a pretty cool atmosphere to have. Yeah. And our last project, I mean, we, we go through the whole thing to sort of follow up with your second part of the question, just about how we talk about like current events and like, yeah, just diversity in the classroom and diversity in ourselves. Obviously, current events, I always want to make sure that students feel like they have a space to talk. And part Mm -hmm. of that's like just making a community in the classroom that's welcoming and that they understand the ground rules, that there's not there's not any question about like, yeah, that's totally fair if you want to have a conversation with each other about what's happening in the world. Like this is a great Mm -hmm. space to do that. Art's a great way to process that. We can learn from each other because everyone kind of brings in their own background. And, you know, sometimes I think this year is particularly fruitful for that. But, you know, there's some years where I'd have to have a little more prompt. <laughs> for example, like, I don't know, it's like not even recently. I feel like this the last four years have just been one of those, like, there's so much out there that's ripe. <laughs> but <laughs> the project that we ended up doing final, our final for 2D design, which I think is just one of those things that students at the, fir- when they first get it, it's just like, is they make artist trading cards. So they do like, like nine or 10, depending on how much time we have artist trading cards which are the size of playing cards Mm -hmm. and they have to sort of like every card is going to have a design but it's going to talk about a layer of their identity Mm. and so they do part of it's like oh I like to go to the gym and I I get that there's kids that just really like vibe with that sort of thing but I I always ask them to go a little deeper to sort Mm -hmm. of dig up some things that they want to share with the class that they're you know willing to but also talk a little bit about their history you know as Mm -hmm. their family maybe what country they're from or like holidays they celebrate and Mm -hmm. I always find that that's a really nice avenue because they're they feel empowered to just visually depict it and also as they're working together you know like throughout the we have 80 minute classes which is pretty long and so about 40 minutes in, I'll have them all stop and take a break because, you know, mm. 
you can't sit for 80 minutes without hurting yourself, I'm sure. <laughs> but like, they also, I'm like, okay, take a little lap around, take a look and see what other people are working on. And mm. I just love seeing the the conversations that sort of stem from that. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just about color, be like, oh, what made you decide that color? Oh, you do that too? That's something my parents also brought into the family. And I just mm-hmm. think that that's one of my favorite parts is watching them interact and sort of take from each other. For just a very compelling sense of self. That's a beautiful way to also build those relationships to like encourage them to share and connect with each other over similarities, but then also like learn about each other's differences and yeah. celebrate them. Yeah, it's beautiful. A fun one. Thank you. <laughs> I would also love to get more into your artwork, (laughs) which (laughs) I can see a little bit behind you. And I've heard a lot about your work, but maybe a good way to start is just describing your work, kind of describing what you do. Yeah. And then we'll also like link to your work. So everyone should go check it out. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will say that my art, I kind of describe myself as primarily a painter. Like I said, I went to school, I went to college in the early 2000s, and I was sort of, an in, I was an interesting kid because my my family wasn't necessarily an artistic family. They were creative. I think like my mom, she's a master baker. And, hmm. you know, I would say that they were all educators in some capacity. And so for hmm. me to be an art school kid, knowing I wanted to be a painter was was a completely new thing for my family. And they were great. They were super supportive from the beginning. But at the same time, I didn't really have a role model, aside from my art teacher in high school, who was great. But you know, you know, you sort of like, the internet really wasn't a thing (laughs) at the time. So I wasn't like relying on social media, which didn't really exist to find people and to make my own way was an interesting time for sure. So for me, when I went to college, I was between quilting and painting. And I was like, I love both of these things. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that there's such a rich history in my my family with textiles and fabric. Mm. You know, my mom always had her sewing machine out and she would make clothes. Like there was definitely like a utilitarian function for her. But for me, it was definitely more of like, what can I build with this? And Mm. so when I went to college, I actually took a number of painting classes where I made quilts in lieu of paintings. And, you know, I took fibers too, and I just like loved it all. And Mm -hmm. I would almost challenge my professors to think about what a definition of a painting was. I mean, I'm sure they were already in context, but I was that kid that would bring in a quilt and be like, here's my (laughs) painting, you know? Uh, I love it. Yeah. And (laughs) and the process was so different. And at the same time, I probably to this day, I could explain that I never had a totally simpatico like experience with both. They don't, they live together, but they don't overlap really there's not a huge venn diagram so i'm still working through that i'm sure we'll get to that but one of the things that i i say that is i'm a very colorful painter i'm sort of semi abstract i really love geometric shapes and so pattern plays a big role but I, even part of it is like going into my nostalgia moving from i've lived in the same generally the same house my entire life my grandmother lived down the street mm-hmm. and you know, she moved out of, she sold her house to move into more of an assisted living home at some point. And I just remembered her wallpaper and the way some of her, like the patterns on her rugs and, and I, that mm. always finds itself in my stuff. It's just part of me. It's like a big part of my history. And I think when you think about quilts and the role they play, I love that they wrap around you and kind of offer you warmth. It's like, I don't know, there's an extension of me in those. And, and so right now I, I work both on those paintings. And I I would say that there are some color similarities, but Mm -hmm. yeah, they're just two practices that I I believe super strongly in and uh, love to do. Yeah. And you can, I mean, I see visually the overlap and where there's elements of quilting in your paintings and there's color sense that I feel like is from painting in your quilts. There's definitely some overlap there. Yeah, I definitely, I see it more and more, I would say. Yeah, thanks. That's that's yeah, huge they'll maybe they'll eventually like <laughs> they'll start to merge. <laughs> so true. I I keep envisioning how that will interact, but how that happens. I mean, I guess it doesn't have to either. 
That's true. I would love to hear more about your process too. I know with your paintings, there's so many layers and there's this level of bravery (laughs) in covering up something good. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Oh, Rebecca, you yeah. This this is one of those things I think the average person would have like hot flashes watching me do. Oh yeah. <laughs> I had some like ooh, palpitations just watching you go through a little slideshow of it. <laughs> yeah. I in in total honesty, it's funny. So I work pretty traditionally. I'm an oil on canvas type of artist. And so and for anyone that's worked on canvas, it's like, it could take a ton of abuse, you know, and I think for me, the oil paint is just, it's beautiful when it's layered. And I I always love to play around with how I can layer different colors and, and textures and even throw in some collage elements. But what I think you're referring to is when I finish a painting, and then I let it dry. And I'm like, okay, maybe this thing is about to live its a different life and go outside my studio. And after like two weeks of me looking at it, I'll bring it back on my easel and basically repaint a different thing on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which <laughs> which I know is like uh, yeah, it's it's terrifying. <laughs> At the same time for me it's like I love that I have a, a different ground to work with that's just not flat white. And and so for me, mm-hmm. I, I definitely have more of an excitement about it. There are components for sure that I think I really try hard to keep the history of the painting in it. Because for me, painting has such a rich history and the progress of it. Everyone kind of, if you've looked at all the old masters, there's so many different ways you could sort of break down their layering. And for me, when I repaint over it, I always try to keep a little hint of something that's underneath. And so, and that to me is really important for the, it's sort of like a little Easter egg. So when you see it, you can sort of find, oh, there was a history of something else here, although it's, it's not totally visible right now. And sometimes that has to do with me just completely changing the composition or adding like an element that maybe didn't even exist in the beginning. But I think, you know, it's like everything evolves. It's there's certain paintings in mind that I have, you know, the the joke is with my husband is like, oh, this painting weighs like 30 pounds just from the paint, you know, like so many layers on it. (laughs) Yeah, but then there's paintings that are for sure done. Yeah, I Mm. I won't mess with them. I'm not crazy. (laughs) (laughs) It makes me think of like, I love that idea of the history of the painting itself. And it also makes me think of when you move into a new place and it's been painted and maybe there's one little spot where things are chipped away and you can see that history, that layer of like, oh, somebody painted it green at one point. Like, (laughs) Yes. Oh, you're totally right. Yeah, there's something about it, like where you know that it's had a life prior to what you're seeing, but you don't quite know all of the the story, which I I think is really kind Mm -hmm. of compelling. Yeah, that bit of mystery. And I feel like that also connects to nostalgia and memory. Like there's, for me, there's pieces of memories that I'm pulling and pulling and can't quite get the full thing. So it's all just these little bits and pieces jumbled up. And that's, yeah, that probably happens for most people. Definitely. Yeah, there was a famous scene in the movie Eternal Sunshine if of the Spotless Mind. If you I saw this like years ago, but this one scene always stuck out for me about memory was when, it's when Jim Carrey was going through his memory bank after he was like, you know, undergoing some sort of his little scientific thing. <laughs> he was trying to forget his girlfriend, but he was going through his own memories and he was sitting as a child in the dentist chair. And he remembers this procedure that he was getting done as a child, but the dentist didn't have a face. Like he didn't remember that part of the memory. And so for me, yeah. I always thought of it like there's just components that our brains just don't hold on to. And at the same time, mm-hmm. you can like make up things, which is kind of empowering too. <laughs> so you yeah. Can, like reinvent what your like reality is, which I think pain yeah. is to an extent. So mm. it's sort of an interesting dynamic, like just being a creative, you have a lot of power. I think part of that is letting for me as as a teacher is giving the students the autonomy to understand that. I love that to recreate your history to some extent. And then would you want to get into the concepts behind your work a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I will say the closest to sort of talk just a little bit more about process. I should say that there are parts of my paintings that I think do recreate quilts. And part of what I think about a lot is just the history of both quilting and also the land that I occupy. I know they don't sound like they have 
a lot to do with each other. But for me as like a maker, one of the things I think about a lot is just concept as I put things together. Mm-hmm. So there, there was a painting that I've been working on for a long time. And I had a sabbatical last year and I, I had a year to sort of, well, a little less than a year because COVID happened. But it was definitely a good time to sort of do some work and find the history of where I inhabit. And I know that I come to the space. I'm not a native for New England, for sure. And believe me when I say New Jersey kind of has its own histories that I know a little bit about. But when I came to New England, like we live in a rural area that's a very sparsely populated section of Western Mass. And for me, we were doing some, we had a retreat a number of years ago that talked a little bit about the history of the land. And it really kind of changed a lot of things because I have a a really good colleague here and she and I were just randomly Googling names of towns and seeing where they got the names from. And Mm -hmm. I was kind of horrified at some of the history of some of the towns. Like we have this town over here called Turner's Falls and, and it had to do with this huge genocide of this river kind of cuts through the town. And, you know, William Turner was this, this war hero, this white guy who came and just killed a bunch of native people. It was Mm -hmm. horrifying. And so that's the sort of thing where I'm like, oh, like that's the history of of the land, thinking about, you know, history of painting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And this one town that is nearby us where we go grocery shop and stuff has a huge, yeah, I would say it's like kind of built up. I mean, there's a huge hill in the middle of the town that's, I don't think is anybody on it because it's really steep. But whenever we drive by, we see like, oh my gosh, there's trash in the river and there's a homeless population. And, you know, I think everyone kind of comes to the space with their own stories. But for us, my husband and I, we've been talking a lot about the history of the land. And when I first started my sabbatical, I did some homework about the tribes that first inhabited the space. And there are two tribes that actually still have a pretty pretty predominant presence over here. It's like the Abenaki tribes and the Pocumtuck tribes. I would say, unfortunately, sequestered into like areas. But, you know, thinking about how we as people call progress, you know, whatever that means to us as, as mm. human species. You know, there's one strip down in this town where there's trash in the river. There's like a McDonald's. There's a Friendly's. You know, it's like a KFC. And I'm just thinking like, is this it? Like, what's... Mm. You know, this boarded up movie theater across the street, which clearly is just done. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. There's something about it that I'm just like, is this what progress looks like? And mm. one of the the paintings that I worked on, which is called Unclaimed History, thought about what the land used to look like before people showed up. You know, maybe mm. when the tribes were still here in a big way and how they were really. One of the things that I, I've really come to learn is just the connection to the land that these these people had for a long time before they got colonized. We brought, we, and I mean, as a white person sit in this category, but like when you bring in new animals or learning how farming changed the landscape and Mm -hmm. even changed how we eat food or how the wildlife migrated because of that or you know Mm -hmm. like just all the little components that change what we know as our realities is interesting and it it took a lot of time you know but these are just stories that I think everyone has their own history with and yeah so I know as a as a white person that I have to do a lot of work on my end to meet not only the needs of my students but also understand my role in this world and how I can be Mm -hmm. better and and what I can do to, as an artist to have these conversations. Yeah, that's so powerful. And I love how it's connected to your process in so many ways. Like there's this history of the land and almost like I picture it similarly to all the layers you have and where one kind of obliterates the last. And that's happened throughout history mm. as well. There's these layers and these, yeah these changes and some might be good some might be bad there's a lot of grays in there what's <laughs> yeah it's hard to know like it how to define it sometimes you know like mm-hmm. yeah I don't know I, I think about that too I've never the only time I've been to that McDonald's is when I was nine months pregnant and I was craving something <laughs> like, I, just, I need yeah so it's <laughs> like, like when you think about like what progress is like when I was nine months mm-hmm. pregnant I had a very different idea of the role of that McDonald's versus now I'm just like I don't even know. You know, there's just components of how we all bring our own histories to it. And Mm -hmm. I think of that a lot in my work because I know that I'm just one person. But there's a lot, there's a lot to learn and be said about it. And it takes every one person, you know, doing that work and 
that internal, like there's so much internal work too, just digging into it and then talking about it and sharing through your painting, through your teaching, all of it. And that also thinking about the space that you occupy, the like the land, the history of the land where you are. Mm-hmm. We didn't, I just realized we didn't talk about teaching and being at a school that's like the students live there, right? Yeah. So there's that other aspect because you're you know living with all of these teenagers (laughs) yeah it does change things for sure because when you think of for me at least when I went to school in high school which was just a regular public school I mean these students see us in every way you know they see us at night yeah they've seen me in my pajamas they've seen me you know (laughs) doing whatever like walking the dog they've seen me do things and I feel like to me I'm, I'm just a human also at the same time as being their mentor and teacher and whatever. So yeah, I think about that too. They come from different parts of the world. I mean, we have a 20% international population and these students, particularly the ones that come from across the world are also just acclimating to a whole new space and they're bringing Mm -hmm. their own histories. You know, they, many come from cities and like to be plopped down into Western mass where there's like not a whole lot happening. It's a very right. quiet night. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's like a learning curve for a number of students and, and how they sort of approach the space and this mm-hmm. community. I mean, how they even like adopt the community is a long-term thing for sure. Yeah. I love hearing about students seeing you, you know, at all times and that you're just a human because there is that aspect of the joke that the students like walk in in the in the morning to the classroom and they're opening the cupboard like where's the teacher the teacher lives here right they never they don't have a life outside of school they're right. just the teacher <laughs> yes. or seeing your teacher at the grocery store and being like ah like, what are yeah. you doing out here yes, totally <laughs> totally <laughs> go back to the classroom <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely that was I remember having that as a kid when I was like you see your your teacher in the wild you know and you're like what right yeah what is this (laughs) yeah absolutely and I I mean I feel a little bit that way with students like I don't want to see them I'm like nervous to see my students out in in the world (laughs) yeah absolutely too yeah it definitely goes two ways (laughs) (laughs) yeah I just feel like that's something that not a lot of teachers I've spoken with anyway have that experience of being at a school that's a boarding school. So you have both. And I do, I love that idea that it's the whole talk about community building that you're really, you get to know each other as people. Yeah, it is pretty special. It reminds me a lot of summer camp, which is why, and my husband and I met at summer camp. We met actually when we were in seventh Uh. grade. So I feel really lucky to have him around here. He teaches in the science department here and we both have these networks that we've carried with us and we have really similar networks because we've had the same friend group forever. And I just think that sharing this position with him and every time we have a camp experience, like we do name games and, you know, the stuff that we have to do as teachers, like classroom management and getting kids to go someplace in an orderly fashion. (laughs) Sometimes I'm just like, this is our skill set. Like this is, you know, it's just a really similar thing. It's like camp with academics. I love that. And I don't know, to me, it's just such a full circle experience. Yeah, that's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I would also kind of coming back to your artwork, I would love to hear more about like the business side of being an artist. And, you know, there's there's teaching, but then there's also like your art career and they overlap in a lot of ways, I know. But I'd love to hear about how are you showing your work? How are you kind of getting opportunities to sell work and just what does that look like and what sort of advice would you have for other artists? That's a great question. I will say the thing that really helped me out was just knowing that everyone has a different journey. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started here, you know, I went to grad school and I worked really hard on this portfolio and I had a huge burnout. I remember just, Mm -hmm. I took like two years off. Granted, I was like teaching and working at Starbucks. So like there really wasn't a lot of room (laughs) for that. And that was Mm -hmm. fine because my brain needed it. I needed a minute. And Mm -hmm. so when I started here and I got the studio, for me, it was always like, okay, how do I get back to this practice and and sell some work, knowing that it probably wasn't going to be my main hustle. Mm -hmm. And for me, as as a quiet kid, the hustle is hard, you know, especially when you need a breather, because you're like, as as much as I love to teach, part of it is an act, like you go in and you have Mm -hmm. to like, you know, 
be full of energy. I'm an introvert. So for sure, I need time where I'm not actively like, like hustling, you know, and I definitely say that it goes through periods. And I think that I've had to offer myself some grace with that. For me, it was a big part of finding a community and knowing what I was able to do with that community. So our department here is very small. We have five people. I know in probably every other traditional situation, visual arts, having five people is huge. But we, we're all in like different stages of our career and we all do very mm-hmm. different work. So we have a sculptor, we have a ceramicist, we have a plein air painter, photo guy. And I would say just even having conversations with them about like, oh, did you hear that there's, you know, a specific festival happening? Are you going to go with your art there? And just having an open mind and, and being open to opportunities has been really cool. I will say that I'm, you know, I think at the end of the day, and I'm just being very honest about this, finding opportunities takes time. And I just had to, I like, I could grind away at it much like I, you know, had that binder of things I applied to. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm comfortable doing the grind, but there is boundaries that I've had to set being like, you know what, I can't apply to everything or I, you know, I have to save time for my actual studio or updating my website. There's so much Mm -hmm. logistical parts to being an artist. And the fun thing I will say is, although sometimes I think it can be deflating to have friends that aren't artists and they don't get what you do, that you are running essentially a small business on the side of your real job. Right. Parenting also is not a small (laughs) feat. So yeah, like there's a lot of times where I've almost been exhausted with the world, but For me, it's never been a question of if I was going to do it. It's just sort of time management has had to be a big part of this, you know, like Mm -hmm. making a planner and setting aside, okay, this is my two hour time in the morning to do studio work. Okay, maybe I'll spend an hour after lunch. Like you, I literally have to pencil it in my planner to do it. Yeah. You know, this is when I'm going to update my website or... Mm-hmm. You know, I take my own photos too, which I wouldn't say is the best solution, but it saves me time. And mm-hmm. I know people out there have setups that are really good, and I don't. <laughs> and it, it's <laughs> like I just sort of rely on my editing skills and my ability to get good lighting, and, and that's really all I need. Mm-hmm. So I think whatever works for you is definitely probably enough. It's really easy to get into that mental headspace where you're like, I don't have enough, like I have so much to do and not enough time. And I've constantly been there. But I think for me, just knowing that everything comes in seasons has been a nice saving grace for me, just in terms of giving myself some room to to just be. That's so helpful. Yeah. And just remembering that every journey is different. It's okay if you need a little time off, even if it's like a couple years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's okay. Even taking those two years off from grad school, although it was kind of a bummer, you know, thinking like, oh man, and all my friends from grad school were getting these opportunities at these really big galleries. But my brain was just like, not there, you know, and I had to just sort of listen to it. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, in the end, it was fun. <laughs> Yeah. It's all fine. Yeah. It's so easy to get caught up in that, in looking at what other people are doing or just wishing that you were putting yourself out there more. But I think there's so much in listening to your gut and reminding yourself that there's more time. Like this is a long game. If you're yeah, if you're planning, if you're like this, you're in it. This is your career. This is your life. Like you're going to be an artist. And I'm going to say a career, whether or not you're actually earning money, it's still a career. Yeah. Just remembering that it doesn't end tomorrow. <laughs> like there's a lot of time. <laughs> Yeah. I had to be reminded recently that not every idea that I have needs to be in one piece. Not every idea that I have even needs to be in one show. Like maybe there's different shows. (laughs) Yeah. I have like this big calendar on like a desktop calendar, you know, holding a planner. I don't know. I was really good at it when I was younger, but as an adult, it's just like everything's on post-its now. Oh my God, it's embarrassing. But (laughs) I have this big calendar on my desk that I just write everything on. I have a section for title painting of my paintings that are potentials. I have ideas. I have schedules. I have stuff for my kids starting kindergarten. I have all that stuff. Uh, all the details. So I just have like a space, which is never going to go away. Like, and then when it gets really dirty, I have a new sheet, but <laughs> that's been my thing too. That's great. It hits you in the face. Yeah. For a long time, I, I had a sketchbook, like planner hybrid, but I think that just got complicated for me. Mm-hmm. I'm not like my brain can't parse that out for some reason yeah. <laughs> or, or I'm not getting as good at, like as a, as a teenager, I think I was fine with it, but 
as an adult, I, I took on a lot more responsibility, clearly. Yeah. So that I just needed to change, change my methods and yeah. just being open to that. Right. And then it might change again later and just, yeah, continuing that flexibility. Yeah. I've had to shift pretty much everything digital so that I get little pop-up reminders. <laughs> like my phone dings at me. Now is your studio time. That's actually <laughs> Do <super> it. <laughs> smart. Yeah. Do you have an app that you use? I just like Google Calendar everything, even meetings that are not meet that are like meetings with myself. It's like now is your yeah. <laughs> your time your time your to do time. this. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a yeah. But that cool. also because I connect it to Calendly is the scheduling app to schedule actual meetings with other people. Mm. But if I officially in my calendar schedule in like studio time, that blocks that time out. So Calendly won't let anybody take that time from me. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then the other, the only other app I really use about this stuff is Keep, just Google Keep, because that's where I can do checklists, to do lists, or just random notes or you know, all kinds of notes and drawings and you can put photos in there. Oh, that's awesome. You should check that out. My little organizational stuff all in a phone. Yes. <laughs> and then you're completely tied to your devices. I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there is a stigma with that too, but it's, I know they're getting sophisticated. Like, yeah. I used to teach digital photo and I want to get off topic here, but my, my students would have these gorgeous SLRs and now they don't. They just use their phones. And I feel like, I, you know, it's like any hardcore photo teacher or photographer that's listening I may have opinions about that. But I think just letting students use their own tech is, is kind of an interesting thing because then they get to, but it's just so good now. Like, Technology is really yeah. good. Yeah. Like I can't hate on it. <laughs> it's like right. nighttime photos that are better than what I was doing with the SLR. <laughs> uh. Totally. Yeah. And there, I think it's a great way to get started, kind of dip your toe in. And then if you love photography, you can figure out how to use yes. the fancy cameras. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would love to get some of the get to know you questions. So one, what are you curious about right now? Really open ended. That's fun. The thing I probably spend a lot of time now that we're into summer just looking up and getting nerdy about is gardening, vegetable gardening. It's one of my favorite things to do when I just want to rest my brain and get my hands dirty. And I'm at home with my son and he's into it too, which is great. So yeah. we just bond over how to prune things, you know, I'll look up videos on when to plant things, you know, that kind of thing. So that's been a really fun adventure because I've this is the first year I think we've been, we moved last summer out of the dorm, <laughs> which was great, but we just adopted a different situation with the land because we are in a mm -hmm. house now so we were growing tomatoes in a pot until last year yeah. but now I get to be a nerd with the garden which has been fun yeah that's amazing to have a little bit of land to grow things yeah yeah I well, love that it's good for my soul it's really good mm. so that's and get into the dirt yeah yeah that's what I've been really curious mm. about like I've bought books on it vegetable gardening in the northeast is one of the books I just bought <laughs> I love it <laughs> yeah. anybody out there we could chat. Yeah. And then, I mean, I love too that I feel like it connects a little bit to the ideas you're thinking about in your work with the land and getting back to nature and how people have used the land and survived off of the land for so long. Yeah. And how that shifted. Yeah, for sure. I definitely see connections too. Like, that's really, yeah. Even though it's not, I guess, a practice, it's, I, I'm definitely seeing themes in, in what I want to be doing with my life. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then I guess this also relates, what is your favorite food? Are you going to be growing any of your favorite food? <laughs> well, yeah, that's a fun, that's a fun one. If I had to live off like the same thing every day for the rest of my life and not get sick of it, it would probably be cornbread. Mm. I just think good, good cornbread, like skillet, like cast iron skillet cornbread where it has mainly butter in it is the best thing on the planet. I love a good cantaloupe like that. I would try to grow that, but I don't know if I'm at that level yet. <laughs> like, Eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to keep it simple. You'll have your field of corn and your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Your cantaloupe. <laughs> cantaloupe and cornbread. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe eventually have a cow so you can... <laughs> I mean, anything chocolate is really... I'm into. I always crave chocolate. So yeah, I know. I, I picked three things. I love food. It brings me a lot. Of you fun. picked 
three C things too. <laughs> That's true. Oh <laughs> that is super true. I don't know. I'm just seeing weird connections. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I wish I could grow chocolate. That would be wild. But I'm not that level either. <laughs> I don't even know if you could do that. Maybe I should Google that after this. Yes. How do I make chocolate? Yeah. Like, what do I need that'll, to? That'll be my next curiosity. <laughs> and then, is there is there anything we kind of missed? Anything that you wanted to touch on but didn't get to? Well, I mean, I I just have to say, there's just a lot of wonderful things happening in the world, and on top of all the the stuff that you probably get from the news, which is very dire mm-hmm. and can feel very hopeless. And I've talked to students this year who have felt like they just don't have the ability to process it all. For me, sharing art and being on Instagram, even though it's another reason to scroll and, you know, be attached to your phone. I think it just opened up a lot of doors for me in terms of seeing what else is out there and feeling like there are some profoundly beautiful things happening on this planet. And I just feel it's hard to not feel hopeful when you're surrounded by a lot of creative, wonderful things that inspire you. So I feel like as a teacher, part of my job is to to show that and also own it. Yeah, uh, I love that. Holding on to the the hopeful things and also sharing that with students when they might not feel so hopeful. Yeah, because students will hold on to things. I mean, there's a lot of things you don't know what they go through. So yeah, showing up for them is, is big. Yeah, that's huge. And then is there anyone that you would want to thank or give a shout out to? Mm, well, I will definitely say my husband, Andy. He's not an artist. He's more of an engineer, but he is probably my biggest supporter when it comes to getting to the studio, even though he probably doesn't understand why. (laughs) He's just been one of those people that has just sort of showed up for me and knows when I need it. When mom needs a timeout, I go to the studio. You know, he's, he's just a great partner and helps me. Yeah. He'd be, he'd be my number one. Yeah. That's so important to have that support person. I feel like, especially when you're trying to juggle multiple jobs, like multiple careers, you're teaching and you're making art and you're figuring out both and parenting on top of it, just a a partner in life. Yeah. It's helpful. (laughs) Partner in crime, partner in life. Love it. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. It's good to have people in your team, Mm -hmm. in your corner that believe in you. So Mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he's it. And I love that. Like, they believe in you, even if they don't entirely understand yeah, totally. <laughs> what it is you're doing. Totally. <laughs> and last thing, where can listeners connect with you online? Good question. So I, I'm i pretty prevalent on Instagram. My name is Lasco Corwin, L-A-S-C-O Corwin, C-O-R-W-I-N. I also have a website, which is also linked to my bio on Instagram, but it's just laurenscottcorwin.com. Pretty much everything I have is on there. I'm actually updating it hopefully in the next day or two. And so by the time your readers hear it, it should be updated. Yeah, that that's pretty much where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you. And I will link to everything as well. So thank you so much, Lauren. This was really wonderful. Such a pleasure yeah. to chat with you. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.